My series has been uh, called God and the Nations, and last time I considered how God began to include the Gentiles into his kingdom and into the church with the conversion of Cornelius and his household as recorded in the book of Acts. And I hope you will see there's a, there's a logical uh, flow to this series because this topic this morning um, naturally arises after considering the previous one. God began to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom, so it leaves us with this question, well, well what, about, what about the Jews? What about the Jewish people and, and their salvation? The gospel was going to begin to go out into all the nations, and there would, be, there would be Jews and Gentiles believing in Christ and being incorporated into the church. The book of Acts records the, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, and Paul began to uh, preach to the Gentiles. He's called the Apostle to the Gentiles. But if you, if you keep reading the New Testament and reading the book of Acts, you'll notice something that happens is that as more and more Gentile people, and a Gentile is just anyone who's not a Jew. That's the biblical name for anyone who's not a Jew in Scripture, Gentile. The Greek word is actually ethne, where we get the word, it's sometimes translated nations. It's where we get the word ethnic or ethnic group. So there are Jews and then there's everybody else the Gentiles. And we notice in the New Testament, as you follow the narrative of Acts, that as more and more Gentiles are coming into the church, especially through the Apostle Paul's ministry, the Jews mostly, most of the Jews, remain outside of the faith and did not believe. And they actually became more and more hostile to the preaching of the gospel, especially the efforts of the Apostle Paul among the Gentiles. They pursued Paul, the Jews, especially the Jewish, especially the Jewish religious leaders, the same type of men who also persecuted and killed the Lord Jesus himself. So we have Gentiles coming in and most of the Jews remaining on the outside. Why? That's the question I want to talk about this morning. And I want us to understand, first of all, the 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 unbelief of the Jews, it, you won't hear a lot about this in normal church situations, but the unbelief of the Jews and the fact that even to this day, most Jewish people are not Christians, have not believed the gospel, have not received Jesus as their Messiah. This fact is a significant problem and it is a terrible tragedy. In fact, it's such a tragedy that Paul, at the beginning of this section of Scripture, says, I have this unceasing anguish and sorrow in my heart for the fact that most of my Jewish brethren are not believers in the gospel of Christ. Paul said, he actually says, if I could go to hell for them, I would. That's how, that's how important this was to Paul. If I could go to hell for my Jewish brethren so that they could be saved, he says, I would, I would do that. Which, of course, is just what Jesus has already done for the rest of us, including Amen. them. The gospel, you know, is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. The gospel is the fulfillment and the goal of everything that God had previously revealed to the people of Israel. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. It's not the antithesis of Judaism. It's the fulfillment of it. The Jews are in the perfect position to receive the gospel. They've already been cultured by the law and the prophets and by the rest of the Old Testament dispensation. And so again, this question why did most of them, and why have most of them not received the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is, a, this is actually an important question that Paul is going to answer in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And this, this message is really a summary of all three of those chapters. And it's a difficult passage. I challenge you to read for yourself. I'm sure many of you have before, but read for yourself Romans 9, 10, and 11. It's a challenging passage of Scripture. 
just to try to unravel Paul's thoughts and, and his logic there. Paul is making an argument in Romans 9, 10, and 11 for why the rejection of the gospel by the Jews is actually going to be a part of God's overarching plan of salvation. This is not something that surprised the Lord. Amen. And God is working out His plan of salvation in spite of the fact that most of His own people, the Jewish people, have rejected his son. Yeah. Now it's important to see that Romans 9 through 11 is a necessary part of Paul's letter to the Romans. It goes back to his thesis statement in chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. Now that statement makes Romans 9, 10, and 11 necessary in the flow of Paul's thinking and his exposition of the gospel. It might seem to a casual Bible reader that when, by the time, if you're reading through Romans and you get to chapter 9, it almost seems like he started a new book, but he hasn't started a new book. It's a part of that thesis that he has already laid out in the first chapter. The gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Very well then. If that is true, they being the chosen people of God, why have the chosen people not chosen to believe the gospel? Now these chapters have caused a lot of debate in Christian circles, as you can imagine. One of the controversies, the significant controversy about these passages has to do with something that has been called replacement theology. And we've referred to this before, but there are those people who believe and who teach that the Jews have been replaced by the church, that Israel has been replaced by the church. And one of the unfortunate parallels to this doctrine throughout the history of the church, and we, are, we should be ashamed to have to say this, but this is the truth, that there has been a pattern and a history of anti-Semitism in the history of the church. If this is something you're not familiar with, it would do you some good to study up a little bit on your church history. Jews have been looked upon throughout history as being inherently wicked and evil and as enemies of the faith. And have not, they have not been treated well by people who claim to be Christians. And I think even to this, even into modern times, there's still this misunderstanding about the place of the Jews in God's purpose. And that's why we need Romans 9, 10, and 11. This is not a passage that we can overlook in spite of the fact that it is difficult to analyze and understand. Now, most of us here are probably not Jewish. We are Gentiles, but Paul speaks directly to Gentiles in Romans 9, 10, and 11. I don't want us to miss this, and I'm going to come back to this mostly at the end of my message. But Paul, Paul warns the Gentiles in these chapters not to become proud, not to look down on the Jews in spite of their unbelief. And the Gentile church has not heeded Paul's warnings in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Most Gentile Christians today fail to appreciate how merciful God has been in grafting Gentiles into the Jewish family tree. We've been, we've been grafted in. They've not been removed. We've been grafted into them. We'll talk more about that. So in my, in my analysis of these chapters, and I'm, I'm giving you a very, I'm painting with some very broad strokes here this morning. We could easily spend a whole series on these chapters. So I hope you will forgive me if I paint with a, some pretty broad strokes, but I think that there are three main components to what Paul is saying in these three chapters. And these components are actually rhetorical questions that Paul is asking, and then he is offering a series of interrelated answers with logical arguments to defend his answers to those questions. 
And it does end up being a, a, a rather difficult passage to unravel. But I'm going to try to unravel it for you to the best of my ability. Here are the three questions that Paul is dealing with. Number one, why did the Jews fall? Number two, have the Jews been rejected by God? And number three, will the Jews be restored? Why did they fall? Have they been rejected? And will they be restored? Those are the three questions. So first of all, let's consider this one. Why did they fall? Why did the Jews fall? Why is it that most of the Jews did not believe the gospel and have not believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, the first answer that Paul gives to this question is that they rejected the gospel because they were busy trying to establish their own righteousness through the law. Something that most of the Jews failed to understand was that they did not become the people of God through keeping the law. They became the people of God through the election of grace. And by the way, the doctrine of election is, a, is really the theological portion of Romans 9, 10, and 11, which is another reason this, these chapters have been controversial. It all began, you see, with Abraham and with God's unilateral or one-sided promise to him and the covenant that God made with this man, Abraham. And that was before the law was given at Mount Sinai. And that's a, that's a very significant point to see. The promise to Abraham came before Mount Sinai. And so their election was not based on Mount Sinai. It was based on the promise that was given to Abraham, which was given by the election of grace. God chose Abraham. God chose to give him that promise. It was not a deal between Abraham and God. The covenant at Sinai was more like that. The covenant at Sinai was God saying, if you will obey this, I will do this. And the people said, we'll do it. We, you have an agreement. The covenant with Abraham wasn't like that. God didn't say, now Abraham, if you do these three things, then I'll bless you. That is not what the promise was. The promise was simply, I will bless you. Yes. And Abraham believed it. Yes. Amen. There would have been no Israel if it were not for God's choice of them beginning with Abraham. So the, doct the doctrine of election really begins with Abraham, and it begins with the people of Israel. And the doctrine of election and is really a, a part of the, of the larger doctrine of grace that's taught all through Scripture. But you see, the doctrine of grace and the doctrine of election is repugnant to a legalist. See, a legalist is someone who thinks that he or she could climb up to God on his own. As if it's some kind of deal between... See, that's what legalism is. A legalist says, I, I'll do my part, and then I'll meet God halfway, and, he'll, and then God will do his part. That's legalism. Keeping the law could not have been the basis for God's election of Israel. They could not claim to be God's people because they had kept the law. Actually, they didn't keep the law. That was, that was part of the problem here. But God had graciously chosen them out of all the other nations, based on his commitment to their ancestor Abraham. They had no other claim on God outside of his mercy toward them. They did not choose God. He chose them. And Paul makes the point here that God has a right to choose whom he will. Because God, God has, he has no obligation to us. No one deserves anything from God, not even the Jews. That's the doctrine of election. And it applies to Gentiles also. We don't deserve anything from God. We have no rights before God. God is not obligated to us. God relates to us on the basis of his mercy and his grace. In other words, if, if, God, if you're saved this morning in Jesus Christ, it's because God graciously chose to save you. That's it. Amen. It's not because you made a deal with God or you met God halfway or you, did, you do your part and God will do his part. That's not the gospel. That's not the doctrine of election or the doctrine of grace. 
So the Jews had forgotten this lesson, you see. They tried to use the law as it, if it were a ladder to climb up to heaven and to God. Now the law, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law was the word of God. It was a revelation of God's own holy nature. But the Jews missed the purpose of the law. The law was not given so that they could become righteous through the law and establish themselves as God's people. That's not why it was given. A right relationship with God would not come through keeping the law, but it had to come another way, and that way had already been demonstrated by Abraham himself. Amen. The law was preparing the Jews for something else, but they missed it. That's right. They missed the whole point of the law. Actually, they had a disturbing history and a long history of rejecting the word of God that came to him, that came to them, including the law. Unlike the Gentiles, the Jews had received a direct revelation from God, a direct word from God. The Gentiles had not received that. They had revelation from God in nature, general revelation, but the Jews had a specific revelation, and throughout their history, they were guilty of rejecting it, refusing to believe it. The one thing, the one quality that had justified their father Abraham was missing from most of the Jewish people throughout their history, and that quality was faith. So why did, this is the question Paul's answering, why did they fall? They fell because of unbelief, he says. They fell because of unbelief. When Christ finally came, they simply persisted in this characteristic unbelief. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As the scriptures predicted, they, they would. In some sense, the Jews had already heard the gospel, even before Christ came, and they had already rejected it repeatedly throughout their history. The gospel had been preached to the Jews prophetically, beginning with the very promise that God made to Abraham, but they most, most of them did not believe. They did not believe it. Remember, it's by faith that we become the true children of Abraham. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Amen. Gentiles become spiritual children of Abraham through believing the gospel. But, but, they also can fall through the same kind of unbelief. So let us take some warning here. If the Jews did not believe the word that came to them and they fell through unbelief, the Gentiles can make the same mistake. We also can neglect the word of God that we have received and fall through unbelief. So let's heed that warning that Paul gives us in these chapters. So that's the first question. Why did they fall? Well, they fell because they thought that by keeping the law they could become righteous. And secondly, they fell through unbelief. Now here's the second question. Have the Jews been rejected? They've fallen, but have they been rejected? Have they been completely and permanently just cut off by God and put out of His sight? Now, you would be surprised how many Christians believe that that's exactly what has happened. I was actually taught that in my theological education, basically. It was more indirect. You kind of caught it rather than being taught it, if you know what I mean. But the assumption was is that the Jews, they were the old covenant people of God and they, got, they just kind of got, they did their part and their part's done and they're just written off and God doesn't even see any Jews anymore. He just doesn't recognize them at all. And the teaching, as the teaching goes, the replacement theology teaching, they've been replaced by the church. Now part of this confusion has probably been a misunderstanding of the difference between the covenants. The apostles, especially Paul, were very clear that the old covenant of law through Moses is no longer in force as a covenant between people and God. We understand that. The law as a covenant is no longer in force. That's the message of the entire book of Hebrews. It's dramatically pictured by the gospel writers in the tearing of the veil in the temple when Jesus died. Remember when he died, it says the veil in the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. That old covenant approach to God is, is, is done. Yes. You do not come to God through Moses. Not even the Jews right. can come to God that way. Christ is the fulfillment of the law, and as Paul says here in Romans 9, 10, and 11, He is the end of the law. He was the goal. 
He was the fulfillment. It's not that Jesus came and erased the law and said, you know all that stuff before, well, never mind about that. Right. No, he was the goal. It was leading up to him so that when he came, of course, he, he fulfilled it. Yeah. When the sun rises in the morning, all the lesser lights disappear. Yeah. Just, that's just the way it is. So now there's a new covenant which was actually promised to the Jews through the prophets in passages like Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. I, I, I leave it to you to read that passage. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 is a promise through the prophet Jeremiah that God's going to make a new covenant. This is given to the Jews. This was not promised to Gentiles. It was promised to the Jews, this new covenant. The new covenant actually is the fulfillment of the original covenant that God made with Abraham. When Jesus came, he was fulfilling that promise. Remember the promise in Genesis 12, 3? Out through you and your seed, I'll bless the whole world. That was the gospel. Yes. He preached the gospel to Abraham. The law, Paul says in Galatians 3, 19, was added. The law was added to what? To that promise until Christ came into the world at the proper time in history. So the law is no longer in force as a covenant. But the Abrahamic covenant is a different matter. Yes. The Abrahamic covenant is an eternal covenant that's never going to end. That covenant is still in force. It has been fulfilled in Christ and in the gospel. And when Christ came, who, who did he come to? He came to the Jews. He, but Jesus wasn't born in Rome or in Greece or in Persia. He was born in Israel. The first Christians were Jews. So it should be obvious that God did not reject the Jews. If God had simply cut them off, then why would the gospel be for them first? If the replacement doctrine is true, then surely the gospel would have simply gone to the Gentiles directly and passed by the Jews entirely. But that is not what happened. And that was not God's plan. Now, there were some of the Jews that did believe it. The first Christians were Jews. They were the Israel within Israel. Or the remnant, Paul calls them, chosen by grace. This remnant has been reserved by God and chosen by God for himself. There's always been a, an Israel within Israel. Jews who believe the gospel are the true Israel within Israel. The true children of Abraham are those who share his faith, not all of the natural children. No Jew is accepted by God just for being a natural descendant of Abraham. Being accepted by God depends on election not ethnic origin or even religious observance. If you want proof of that, just consider two men, Ishmael and Esau. Both of them were descendants of Abraham, but they were not elected. It was Isaac and, J and then Jacob who were chosen, according to the election of grace. So ele again, election, you see, this doctrine, it, it shouldn't intimidate us. It shouldn't intimidate you when you hear about the doctrine of election. Yeah, that's right. It intimidates a lot of Christians. But election is really just an extension and an application of the doctrine of grace. Amen. God saves you because He wants to. Yes. Amen. Not because you make a deal with God or you, be, you were good or you did your part or you were religious or you were moral. No, that's not how we're, we become the people of God. And that's true of the Jews too. The only way anyone has a relationship with God is through his choice to be gracious, not because of any human merit or action. Now, what about those Jews who did not believe? There were some Jews who believed. Most of them did not believe. What about them? Paul gives an answer. They were hardened. That's actually what he says here in these chapters. This gives people all kinds of problems. Modern people do not want to hear something like that in the Bible. Modern people raise a chorus of objections at this point saying that God hardened somebody's heart. Modern people will say, well, that's not fair. Yeah. That, what about free will? That you can't, God wouldn't harden someone's heart. I mean, that, that violates their free will. It's not fair. Yeah. 
Wish we had a dollar for every time we heard people say that about something relating to God. It's not fair. God's not being fair. Well, we must remember that if God were simply being fair, no one would be saved at all. It would be fair for all of us just to go to hell. We also must remember when it comes to the Jews in particular, they all heard the word of God. No one can charge God with being unfair or, or not giving the people a chance to hear and believe. God has been fair. God has been more than fair. He has been merciful. And really everything depends not on God being fair, but on God being merciful. If we have any hope at all, it's not in God being fair with us. It's in God being merciful to us. And you know what? God is free to be merciful to whomever he wants to be. That's what Paul says here. Paul says God, is, God can be merciful to whom he will. He can harden whomever he will. Have you got a problem with that? That's literally what he said. I mean, I'm paraphrasing him, obviously. But if Paul were here today, maybe he would say it like that. God can do what he wants. You got a problem with that? You going to talk back to God? You, you think you're big enough to talk back to God? Some people think they are. A lot, of, a lot of people in our generation think they are big enough to do that. God is the potter. We are the clay. Let us never forget that. So we don't have any right to complain about God's being merciful or God hardening. There was a believing remnant of Jews to whom God was merciful. The rest who were unbelieving were hardened. And many of the Jews remain hardened, remain hardened to this day. And really, Paul is challenging us significantly in this passage concerning our attitude toward God. Is it right for us to talk back to God, to question His decisions, we who are so dependent on His mercy? Is it right for us to go, God, why did you do it that way? That's not how I would have done it. You ever... I've heard preachers say that. You ever heard a preacher say that? Well, this isn't how I would have done it, but this is how God did it, you know? Ha, ha, ha. Well, this is how God did it. He had, some of them he had mercy on, others he hardened. You got a problem with that? Paul says, this challenges our, our attitude toward God and our view of God. We need to consider this. This is not Calvinism. This is Paul. If Calvin talked about it, he got it from Paul. So this partial, some of the Jews have been hardening, hardened, but Paul says it's a partial hardening. This does not mean they've been completely rejected. Just think of them as something like a family tree. Has the tree been pulled up by the roots and replaced? God forbid. Some branches were removed because of their unbelief, yes, but the root remains in the ground and it will always be there. That root is the original promise that God made to Abram that was fulfilled in Christ and the gospel. Now remember that Abrahamic covenant was unilateral. God was going to do it himself. It was not dependent on Abraham doing anything. And so in some sense, God's purpose does not, ma it does not matter to God's purpose how many Jews believe and how many Jews disbelieve because the promise stands and has been fulfilled and made good through Christ. Yes. So in a, there's, in a sense, if all of the Jews had fallen through unbelief, the promise would have still been fulfilled. If all the Jews had believed, the promise would have been fulfilled. You see what I'm saying? It, it was not, the promise of God to Abraham was not dependent on the Jews, their belief. God did not say, if you believe it, I'll do it. He said, I'll do it, now believe it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Many of them didn't. Yes. Some of them did. Now if God, here's how Paul reasons, if God could graft in wild Gentile branches into the family tree, then it is not really difficult to put the natural Jewish branches back into their own tree. And everything is ready and waiting for them to be put back into their own family tree. Yes. 
God continues to stand with his hands held out to the Jewish people as he has done for so many centuries in spite of all their rebelliousness and obedience and disobedience to him. If they would but turn to him, he would save them. And that leads us to my, my third question. Will they be restored? Now, that question presupposes, first of all, that they are in fact separated from God by their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. In other words, the Jews are not accepted just by being Jewish. It is also presupposed in asking the question, will the Jews be be, will they be restored? We are presupposing that the Jews still have a certain identity. They have not disappeared from the face of the earth. There are still Jews who are distinctly Jews and can be identified as such. They have not been assimilated or amalgamated just and so as to cease to be a distinct people. We are also presupposing in this question that God has not completely rejected them and that they can be restored as we have just established in the previous point. In other words, the question I'm asking now is not can they be restored? Of course they can be restored, but will they in fact be restored? Now let's step back for a moment and, and look again at what Paul is doing in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Here's how the plan of God unfolded. The gospel went to the Jews first, as it should have. Most of them rejected it. This rejection of the gospel by the Jews opened the door for the inclusion of the Gentiles. The Jews were then hardened, and the Gentiles became, began coming into the kingdom. Now Paul stops at this point and says, by the way, even their rejection of the gospel caused something good to happen. They rejected the gospel, the Gentiles got in. If the Jewish rejection of the gospel made that happen, what might happen if the Jews actually turned to Christ? And so Paul begins to contemplate that possibility. And he says this, if the Jews were converted, it would mean the injection of new life into the whole Christian enterprise. It'd be like another resurrection. Amen. And if it were going to happen, it would have to be from God. The salvation of the Jews depends on God and his mercy. God can restore them if he will. So is there any hope that he will? Well, Paul answers that question, citing promises given to them in Scripture that the Jews will not always be disbelieving and rejecting their Messiah. When the Jews do turn to Christ, it will be by the sovereign grace of God, not because of any human activity. It's not, this isn't what Paul's talking about in Romans 9, 10, 11, with the Jews, actually he comes to it at the end in chapter 11. What he's talking about there is not going to come because we got together, raised some money, and sent missionaries to Jerusalem. Now, there's nothing wrong with sending missionaries to Jerusalem. Please understand me. But that's not how it's going to happen. Amen. Actually, that's not how the Gentiles got in either. Right. We just talked about Cornelius. Uh -huh. God was the one that moved in that, that whole situation. Peter, Peter was just, just got hungry one day. And then it all happened. Mm -hmm. that's, that's God, see. When the Jews do turn to Christ, it will be the sovereign grace of God, and all the glory of God, all the glory will go to God for his amazing grace and mercy. Paul says that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then the Jews will be brought in. So the natural question is, well, when, that's, when is that going to be? Well, unfortunately, there are some things about the future that have not been revealed. Some things remain ambiguous, and they must remain ambiguous. You remember when Jesus, before he went back into heaven, after his resurrection, the disciples asked him, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, Jesus could have immediately replied, uh, gentlemen, put that out of your minds. That's never going to happen. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus simply said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's a good word for us today. We're not here to talk about end times prophecies and how it relates to the news that was on the TV last night and all, and all of those things and try to predict the future and when this is going to happen. Uh, that's all carnal. What is certain is that God is not finished with the Jews. Amen. 
At some point in the future, the Jews will come to Christ, and they will come to Christ in large numbers. There's no doubt that this Jewish revival will change the face of Christianity and will probably spark a new surge of preaching and evangelism among the nations, just like in the book of Acts. So Paul asserts with perfect confidence in God that all Israel shall be saved, just as the full number of Gentiles will be saved. Before the end, the full number of Jews will also be brought in. And of course, we're, we're saying that Jews and Gentiles are going to be saved the same way, through faith in Jesus. It's not a Gentile gospel and then another gospel for the Jews. They're all, everybody's getting in the same way. We expect this to happen because of the promises that God has made to the Jewish people. And God cannot lie. Amen. God did promise Abraham, you remember, that his descendants would be like the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. So let me review and then conclude. Here is the essence of Paul's argument in Romans 9 through 11. First, why did the Jews fall? Well, because they were busy trying to establish their own righteousness through the law, and they fell through unbelief. They did not believe, really believe the word that God had sent them. Secondly, have they been rejected? Well, while, while it's certain that the old covenant is no longer in force, this does not mean that the Jewish people have been written off by God. There has always been a believing remnant of Jews. Most of the Jews did not believe, and they have been hardened in their hearts. But the Jews can be restored just as easily as natural branches might be reintroduced into the tree from which they sprouted in the first place. We who are Gentiles have not replaced them. We have been grafted into their family tree, the root of which is God's promise to Abraham that has been fulfilled in Christ and the gospel. So there's absolutely no place in the church for any feelings of superiority or hatred towards Jews. Remember that as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. That's Romans 11, 28, 29. And then finally, will the Jews be restored? Paul envisions a time when the Jews will be brought to faith in Christ in large numbers. When it does happen, it will inject new life into Christianity. So God is not done with the Jews. But their salvation, just like the salvation of the Gentiles, is based entirely on the mercy of God and not on any human desire or action. In the end, the full number of Jews will be brought in and all Israel shall be saved. Amen. Now what about us Gentiles? And here I'm going to end with this application, as I said I would, because most of us here are Gentiles and not Jewish people. It seems like this whole discussion, as you read Romans 9, 10, 11, it seems like this whole discussion is a conversation that you're overhearing that's not about you. But actually, what Paul is saying about the Jews and their salvation closely concerns the salvation of the Gentiles. Gentiles must remember that being saved through Christ means in some way becoming a part of the Jewish family. We are grafted in, and we get to share in all the blessings that were originally promised to Abraham and his family. By the grace of God, through faith, we who are Gentiles by birth are no longer outsiders, but can become children of Abraham. Amen. It's a wonderful blessing to be adopted into God's family, and Gentiles should be greatly humbled by the mercy of God. There's no place for boasting in God's family because everyone is there by God's mercy and grace, not because of works that we have done to earn our place there. Amen. Gentiles can and should learn many lessons from the history of the Jewish people, particularly the dangers of unbelief and disobedience to the Word of God. Paul makes it very clear, if, if God didn't spare them, do you think He's going to spare you Gentiles? If God did not spare the Jews when they were un unfaithful, there is no possibility of Gentile unfaithfulness being excused. Amen. Both Jews and Gentiles should remember that no one is saved because of merit or works that we do, but only because of God's mercy and God's grace. And in the end, all of us, both Jew and Gentile, must fall on our knees in thanks and praise to God and say, truly, salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen.